In just a minute, we're going to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 22. When we're looking at prophets and priests and kings, there's not a whole lot of priests in the Bible that get some special focus, and sometimes the ones that do get some focus are ones that are not very good examples to us. They're kind of more of examples of what not to do, what not to be. But there's at least one here that, that is a good example. Uh, if you're, while you're turning to there, I just want to throw out this as I have in other sermons too. In the Old Testament, leadership was by prophets, priests, and kings. The bulletin cover reflects that. There's uh, prophets who declare God's word. There are priests who make sacrifices. And there are kings who lead and give administration. And then Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king. He fulfilled all of those roles, and he did them in a perfect way, whereas everyone else who has gone before him did so in an imperfect way that pointed ahead to him. So let's answer this question together. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father, and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God for our deliverance. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by His Word and Spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom He has won for us. And then as Christians, we are called by Christ's name. We are prophets and priests and kings. We are anointed even as He is. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ And so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. And so we are prophets and priests and kings. Today we're going to kind of focus a little bit on priests, what it means to be a priest. Now priests are concerned with what we offer up to God. I kind of had something click with me this week. Priests are what, are what we offer up to God. So if God is in heaven, we offer up sacrifices and we observe festivals and we do things that point us to God, things that we offer up to God. And then there's prophets. They focus on God's communication to us. So prophets are relaying God's messages. So they're saying, thus says the Lord. Here's what the Lord is saying to you. And that's prophets. And then kings. Kings are leadership and administration for the people. So kings make sure that what God has said gets carried out and that the priestly functions are properly observed, and that God's people are protected, among other things. If this helps you at all, then, then uh, yeah, if it confuses you, then you can just let that go. But prophets and priests and kings. Priests are concerned with what we offer up to God. So, let's look at our passage. Second Chronicles 22, I'm going to start at verse 10 of 22. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family in the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were about to be put to death. And she put him in and his nurse in a bedroom. Thus Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king of Joram, and the wife of Jehoadiah, the priest, because of was a sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not put him to death. And he remained with them six years, hidden in the house of God, 
while Athaliah reigned over the land. But in the seventh year, Jehoiada took courage and entered into a covenant with the commanders of hundreds, Ahaziah son of Jehoram, Ishmael the son of Jehonanan, Azariah the son of Obed, Maseah the son of Adiah, Elishaphet the son of Zikri. And they went through Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of the fathers of the houses of Israel. And they came to Jerusalem. And all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And Jehoiada said to them, Behold, the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. This is the thing that you shall do of you priests and Levites who come off duty on the Sabbath One-third shall be gatekeepers, and one-third shall be at the king's house, and one-third at the gate of the foundation. And all the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. Let no one enter the house of the Lord, except the priests, the ministering Levites. They may enter, for they are holy. But all the people shall keep the charge of the Lord. The Levites shall surround the king, each with his weapons in his hand, and whoever enters the house shall be put to death. Be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. The Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiadiah, the priest, commanded. And they each brought his men who were to go off duty on the Sabbath with those who were to come on duty on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada, the priest, did not dismiss the divisions. And Jehoiada, the priest, came, gave to the captains the spears and the large and small shields that had been King David's, which were in the house of God. And he set all the people as a guard for the king, every man with his weapon in his hand, from the south side of the house to the north side of the house, around the altar and the house. Then they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him, and they said, Long live the king! When Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she went into the house of the Lord to the people. And when she looked, there was the king, standing by his pillar at the entrance, and the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoicing and blowing trumpets, and the singers with their musical instruments leading in the celebration And Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! Then Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains who were set over the army, saying to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, Do not put her to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, and she went into the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, and they put her to death there. And Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they should be the Lord's people. Then all the people went to the house of Baal and tore it down, his altars and his images, and they broke in pieces. And they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And Jehoiada posted watchmen for the house of the Lord under the direction of the Levitical priests and Levites, who David had organized to be in charge of the house of the Lord to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, according to the order of David. He stationed the gatekeepers at the gates and the house of the Lord, so that no one should enter who was in any way unclean. And he took the captains, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord, marching through the upper gate to the king's house. And they set the king on the royal throne. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword. All right. So, what happened here? There's a lot of names being mentioned here, and these aren't ones that we normally talk about or look at here. So, we'll look at what happened. Jehoiada was a priest in the temple of Jerusalem during a tumultuous time. He was the the chief priest at the time. I made this little diagram to maybe help you keep track of the names. Jehoshaphat and Joram, those were the kings of Judah. Jehoiada is on the far left, and he married one of the daughters of Jehoram. 
And then there's Ahab and Jezebel. You might recognize those names. Uh, They were king and queen of the northern kingdom. They were considered the most wicked king and queen of that whole kingdom. And they made Baal the institutional religion of that nation. And one of their children was Queen Athaliah. And she married Jehoram. And that is who Athaliah is here. So King Ahaziah, who's uh, Athaliah's uh, son there, he is killed while he's outside the country. Now, typically the king's son assumes the throne, but after her son dies, she decides that she wants to rule, and so she decides to kill off the whole royal family. She seizes the throne, and she takes over everything. So she is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, and in in consistency with that family is somebody who rules with an iron fist and doesn't really care about how many people they have to kill as long as they're in charge and in control of everything. Jezebel comes from a Phoenician city of, of Sidon, actually, and kings there had a different way of ruling than the kings of Israel did, or at least the way the kings of Israel were supposed to. The kings there were basically gods, and whatever they said went. In Israel, the kings were accountable to God, and they had to follow God's laws just as much as everybody else did. And so there were certain parameters on that. But in Phoenicia, in Sidon, they could do whatever they want. And so Athaliah is basically doing whatever she wants in order that she can rule and reign. All right, so Jehoiada's wife, Jehosheba, or Jehoshabeth, hides the king's infant son, Joash. She says, she recognizes that what is going on is wrong, and so as all of these, all of these people are being put to death because they're part of the royal line, she decides to take at least Joash and hide him. She is of the royal blood, and so she has access to the palace, and so she uses that access to hide Joash. She hides him in the temple where her husband is a priest. And then seven years go by, and the king's son, Joash, grows up a little bit. He's at least seven years old. And then after seven years, Jehoiada leads a coalition to put the rightful king back on the throne. Now, God had said and decreed that David's family is to be the royal family. And so his sons and his line are to be the ones who rule. Athaliah has staged a coup and has usurped that and basically disregarded that. Jehoiada, the priest, says this isn't right. We need to go back to what God has instituted and put David's descendant on the throne. So for seven years, somebody else had usurped that throne, and Jehoiada is acting to right this wrong. It took place on Sabbath, maybe you noticed that. That was because there was this big changing of the guard on the Sabbath, and if there were lots of troop movements, then nobody would notice anything, because apparently Athaliah didn't really pay attention to what went on in the temple. She was too busy worshiping Baal in his temple. So under guard... They crown Joash king in the temple. And all the people rejoiced, it said, except for Athaliah who cried out treason and tore her clothes, which is really just ironic because she was the one who committed the treason. And now to betray her is apparently treason. The way she operates is that might makes right. And so even by her own standards, what, what is there to be... Treason. I don't know. It's one of those cases where the perpetrator is claiming to be the victim. Treason, she says. So anyways, that's what's going on here. Jehoiada is setting the rightful king back on the throne. Jehoiada was a champion of doing things God's way. 
when he looked around and he saw that things were not going as God intended or God decreed. And so he decides to take some action and decides we are going to do things God's way. He has some position and some authority to make that happen and so he uses it. He doesn't use it for his own advantage. He uses it to do things as God said. So in 23, verse 3, he saw that the God-appointed royal line was back on the throne. He used his power and his influence to gather all of the powerful people in the land together. And he says, we are going to put the rightful king back on the throne. And everybody was like, sounds good, let's do that. He says, behold, the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. In other words, we're going to do what God says. Let him reign as the Lord spoke. Then in verse 16, he had all the people renew their covenant vows to God. He gathered all the people, or at least all the representatives of the people, and he says, we are going to renew our covenant to God, that we are going to just worship him, that we're going to obey him, we're going to follow him, we're going to be his people. Like we said a little bit ago with the Heidelberg Catechism, we belong body and soul and life and death to Jesus Christ. He says, let's renew that covenant. We belong to the Lord. We're going to be his people. We're going to follow him. And everybody does that. It says, Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they should be the Lord's people. We are the Lord's people today because we love and follow Jesus Christ. And then immediately afterwards, the people get rid of veil worship. They destroy the temple of Baal. And so they are committed to worshiping just the Lord after that. In verse 18 of chapter 23, he reorganizes the temple because he's the priest. And when he does that, he does it by the book. He goes by the book. So verse 18, Jehoiada posted watchmen for the house of the Lord under the direction of the Levitical priests and the Levites whom David had organized to be in charge of the house of the Lord, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses. He's following the book. What does the Lord say? Okay, that's what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to organize it that way. He looks at what the law of Moses is, and he carries it out, as well as the order of David and how he organized it. Athaliah is an example of somebody who has their own ambitions, their own agendas, doesn't really care what God says, and just kind of does whatever, according to whims and personal ambition. People have their own agendas to rule and control, but doing it God's way is what ends in rejoicing. Maybe you noticed that at, at the end there. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet, after Athaliah had been put to death. People rejoice when we do things God's way. Because if you, if you know much about the Lord and have you walked with him for a while, you know that one of the things that God has us do is that we love him first, above all, and we love our neighbors as ourselves. And so if we are in positions of power, if God puts us in power, whether that's power over families or over employees or whatever. When we are in power, we use that power and authority to serve. We take into consideration the people that we are leading and what their needs are, and we use our authority to serve. When we use our authority for our own ambitions, everybody suffers. Everybody else suffers. We might benefit, but we rule and command and just use our position for ourselves. And so there's a different character there. If you love the Lord and you want to do things by His book, then you are going to be a blessing to the people that you lead. And because of the way you lead, following the Lord, they are going to rejoice Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, 
reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. When we follow what God says, people rejoice, including us. That might mean some sacrifices on our part, but when we do what God wants us to do, and when we are serving and actually loving our neighbors, most of all, the Lord himself, we are blessing others. We are not taking advantage of them. We are not sucking them dry. We're not stepping on them to get somewhere else. So when you follow the Lord, there's a different character to your leadership. Jehoiada is a Christ-like figure because he sets the nation right with God. When Christ came, he fulfilled all of the sacrifices, all of those ceremonies of the law that are written in Leviticus and Numbers and Exodus and such. And so we don't have animal sacrifices anymore. And the reason why is because he is the ultimate sacrifice. And so when we worship God now, we come before him perfectly. We come before him in the name of Jesus so that when this we gather here today, when we worship the Lord, when we sing to him, when we offer him our gifts, we have a perfect intercessor for us so that when we offer up anything to the Lord, he receives it perfectly. He is the perfect priest. And whatever we do in his name, according to the book, of course, it offers and God receives it perfectly. Right now, Satan has dominion over the world and false worship is rampant. And Jesus will return and all things will be restored. And we will have perfect fellowship with God forever. Now, if you still have your Bibles open, I want you to look at verse 2 of the next chapter. 24, verse 2. Joash, that's the, the young king, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. So, for as long as Jehoiada lived, King Joash did what was right. After Jehoiada died, King Joash follows other influences and starts worshiping idols. So this priest, because of his godly leadership, affected a whole kingdom because he had good influence on the king. And as soon as he died, that all fell apart. If you have your Bibles open, start reading at verse 17. The screen says through verse 22. I'm going to just read through verse 19. 24, verse 17. Now after the death, excuse me, the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them. And they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the ashram and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. How important it is to have a godly influence in our life. That is so important. The people that we look up to and that we respect, the people that we listen to most have quite an influence on us. It's important that the people that we listen to and respect are godly people. If they're not, if they're just good people in the eyes of the world, then we've got got some worrying to do. We're going to be led astray. Something that I've kind of noticed in my life and just not only myself but in other people I've seen we tend to become like the people we hang out with. The people that we hang out with, the people that we spend time with, we tend to become like them. We tend to talk like them. We tend to adopt their, their preferences, their means of entertainment, the way they think. We tend to become like them. 
So it's important that we choose our friends very wisely and we choose our influences very carefully. So find somebody who radiates Christ and imitate them. Imitate them. There's a number of times in the New Testament when it says, you know, follow me even as I follow Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. It says in 1 Corinthians 11. Or whatever you you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Or in Hebrews, remember your leaders, those who spoke you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. There's people in our lives that we highly respect them and we would not want to disappoint them. Think of who that would be for you. Who is somebody in your life that you would not want to disappoint? Who is somebody whose disapproval you would not want to have to endure? Who is somebody whose opinion that you respect so much that you look to them for leadership? Particularly in times when you are confused or uncertain about what to do. That, whatever, whoever you have in your mind right now is the person who most influences you. Is that person a godly person? Is that somebody who goes by the book? Is that somebody who loves the Lord and is eager to serve Him and do what is right? It's very important that the people we look up to and respect are people who look to the Lord. How important it is also to be a godly influence in another's life. This is what Jehoiada did. He was a godly influence in the life of Joash. In Proverbs, there's a lot of advice giving. If you're familiar with Proverbs, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of advice giving. It speaks in terms of like a father to a son. And spiritually, we can be fathers to people or mothers to people. We can pass down our wisdom. We can mentor people, help raise them in the faith. There's a lot of people out there who don't have godly fathers or mothers. They need somebody else to fill that role. To say, this is what it means to be a man of God. This is what it means to be a woman of God. To have an example and to teach them, this is what that looks like. And this is why. Everybody needs somebody to have that... We all need somebody to ask us, how is your walk with the Lord? We need somebody to ask that to us. Do you spend time with him every day? Is your faith growing? Are you serving him? Are you witnessing somehow? We need to do that for others too. So let's be that person in somebody else's life who asks those questions. If we don't get asked those things, they easily slip our minds. But if we're asked about them, that puts it on our mind and then we think about it. It's important to have godly influences in our lives and it's important to be a godly influence in somebody else's life. So some thoughts for us here. Be somebody who lives by the book who listens to what God has to say, takes it seriously, and does it, like Jehoiada did, who follows what the Lord says. Because doing it God's way ends in rejoicing. It might mean some difficult times, it might mean some making some sacrifices for the good of others, but doing it by the book, doing it God's way, ends in rejoicing. And be someone who encourages and instructs the young, not just in age, I'm talking spiritually. Someone who encourages and instructs the young in the ways of Christ. Be somebody who follows Christ and somebody who teaches others how to follow Christ. We all need somebody to ask us those questions about whether we are following Christ. Let's be that person to someone. There's, who knows how big 
of an influence we might end up having. Jehoiada influenced the whole kingdom. We might end up influencing a whole family or a whole business because of we are asking those questions of someone. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Lord our God, we are thankful for your servant Jehoiada, the priest. Lord, we, we want to we look to him as, as an example of Christ and we want to follow him even as he pointed ahead to Christ. A Lord, make us a positive influence, an influence for Christ in this world and give us people who influence us for Christ too. Lord, use us by the power of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.